Threads of History, a podcast that aims to go back in time to connect an event or instance to its origin through several threads of continuity across time, space, culture, and historic moments. Welcome to the podcast. I am Mike Shellhammer. Today's episode is on a rift between former political allies, the creation of a major but short-lived political party, and the presidential election of 1912, which would allow for the United States to remain neutral regarding the First World War for several years, changing the trajectory for American foreign policy for decades to come. Today's topic came from a thought I had when listening to my favorite podcaster, Dan Carlin, on his Hardcore History podcast. He spoke of Theodore Roosevelt and his actions during the Spanish-American War, along with his very pro-war, pro-America nationalist stance at the time. I wondered, what if Teddy had won the election of 1912 and been in office? When the Great War broke out in 1914, what would that have looked like? When Theodore Roosevelt had the presidency thrust upon him with the assassination of William McKinley, he was somewhat of a known commodity, given his experience in the public eye as a writer, the governor of New York, and the leader of the Rough Riders Brigade in the Spanish-American War. When he became president in September 1901, it was no surprise that he would become a driving force for antitrust and progressive policies and quickly cement himself as the head of the Republican Party. Theodore, or T.R., apparently he hated being called Teddy, served his country as president and was able to accomplish many things in his two terms. Roosevelt enjoyed being president and was still relatively youthful in 1908. In fact, he was the youngest president ever at that time, but felt that a limited number of terms provided a check against some form of dictatorship. Roosevelt ultimately decided to stick to his 1904 pledge not to run for a third term. People wondered who Roosevelt would charge with being the next presidential hopeful for the Republican Party. New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes loomed as a potentially strong candidate and shared Roosevelt's progressivism, but Roosevelt disliked him and considered him to be too independent of the party's power players. Instead of Hughes, Roosevelt settled on his own Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, who had ably served under Presidents Harrison and McKinley in various positions before serving in his administration. Roosevelt and Taft had been friends since 1890, and Taft had consistently supported President Roosevelt's policies. Roosevelt was determined to install the successor of his choice. At the 1908 Republican Convention, Memmi chanted for four years more of a Roosevelt presidency, but Taft won the nomination after Henry Cabot Lodge, another prominent Republican leader, made it clear that Roosevelt was not interested in a third term. My teacher senses are tingling here. Technically speaking, it wouldn't be a third term elected for Roosevelt. He was only elected as president in the election of 1904. But it would be nearly a third term served if he had won the election of 1908, since he'd served out the remaining three plus years of McKinley's presidential term due to McKinley's assassination. So in the 1908 election, Taft easily defeated the Democratic nominee, the three-time Democratic candidate William Jennings Bryan. Taft promoted a progressivism that stressed the rule of law. He preferred the judges rather than administrators or politicians make the basic decisions about fairness. Taft usually proved to be a less skillful politician than Roosevelt, and he lacked the energy and personal magnetism. Along with the publicity devices, the dedicated supporters, and the broad base of political or public support that made Roosevelt so much of a formidable political opponent and political leader. When Roosevelt realized that the lowering of the trade tariffs would risk creating severe tensions inside the Republican Party by pitting manufacturers and farmers against merchants and consumers, he stopped talking about that issue, whereas Taft ignored the risks and he went 
after that tariff boldly and encouraged the reformers to fight for lower rates. And then he went around and cut some deals with conservative leaders that kept overall rates high. The resulting Payne Aldrich tariff from 1909, signed into law early in President Taft's tenure, was too high for most reformers, and Taft's handling of the tariff alienated all sides of the debate. Basically, he chose the worst parts of both sides' arguments, and that's where it ended up going, the tariff. So it was a bit of a crisis that was building inside the party because this was ripping apart different factions within the Republicans. While that was happening, Roosevelt was touring Africa and Europe, just allowing Taft to be his own man and stand on his own two feet as president. Roosevelt had attempted to refashion Taft into a second version of himself, but as soon as Taft began to display his individuality, the former president expressed his disenchantment with Taft. He was offended on election night when Taft indicated that his success had been possible not just through the efforts of TR, but also because of his own brother, Charlie. Roosevelt was further alienated when Taft, intent on becoming his own man, did not consult him about cabinet appointments. Roosevelt and other progressives were ideologically dissatisfied over Taft's conservation policies and his handling of the tariff when he concentrated more power in the hands of conservative party leaders in Congress. Regarding radicalism and liberalism, Roosevelt wrote a British friend in 1911, quote, Fundamentally, it is the radical liberal with whom I sympathize. He is at least working towards the end for which I think we should all of us strive. And when he adds sanity and moderation to courage and enthusiasm for high ideals, he develops into the kind of statesman whom I alone can wholeheartedly support. Unquote. Roosevelt urged progressives to take control of the Republican Party at the state and local level and to avoid splitting the party in the way that would hand the presidency to the Democrats in 1912. He would actually be, sorry, spoilers, he would actually be the source of the splitting of the party in 1912, handing the presidency over to the Democrats. However, Roosevelt would seem to be an axe to the log that was the Republican Party, and he drove a wedge that would splinter it in the coming presidential election, doing what he hoped he could have avoided somehow uh, through his actions here and through the work that he did with these progressives uh, and with other factions within the Republican Party. In August 1910, Roosevelt gained national attention with a speech at Oskawanatomi, Kansas, which was the most radical of his career and marked his public break with Taft and the conservative Republicans. Advocating a program of new nationalism, Roosevelt emphasized the priority of labor over capital interests, a need to more effectively control corporate creation and combination, and proposed a ban on corporate political contributions. My God, could you imagine an outright ban on corporations giving to political campaigns? It would be outrageous today. Uh, it was outrageous then. He was obviously not able to implement it. But how would anyone in Congress get elected these days if they had no corporations bankrolling them? Uh, wouldn't it be great? Returning to New York, Roosevelt began a battle to take control of the state Republican Party from William Barnes, Jr., whom he would later confront in a Barnes versus Roosevelt libel trial. Taft had pledged his support to Roosevelt in this endeavor, and Roosevelt was outraged when Taft's support would actually fail to materialize at the 1910 state convention. Roosevelt nonetheless campaigned for the Republicans in those 1910 elections, in which the Democrats gained control of the House for the first time since the 1890s. Among the newly elected Democrats was New York State Senator Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who argued that he represented his distant cousin's progressive policies better than his Republican opponent. The Republican progressives interpreted the 1910 defeats as a compelling argument for the complete reorganization of the party in the next year. Senator Robert M. La Follette of Wisconsin joined with Pinoch, William White, and California Governor Hiram Johnson to create the National Progressive Republican League. Their objectives were to defeat the power of political bosses at the state level and to replace Taft at the national level. 
Despite skepticism of the new league, Roosevelt expressed general support for its progressive principles. Between January and April 1911, Roosevelt wrote a series of articles for the Outlook defending what he called, quote, The great movement of our day, the progressive nationalist movement against special privilege and in favor of an honest and efficient political and industrial democracy, unquote. Roosevelt continually criticized Taft after the 1910 elections, and the break between the two men became final after the Justice Department filed an antitrust lawsuit against U.S. Steel in September 1911. T.R. was humiliated by this suit because he had personally approved of the acquisition that the Justice Department was now challenging. Now, remember, the Justice Department would be under the purview of the president and of the attorney general appointed by the president. However, Roosevelt was still unwilling to run against Taft in 1912. He instead had hoped to run in 1916 against whichever Democrat beat Taft in 1912. He still wasn't there. He wasn't yet willing to go against Taft at the uh, at the convention level, trying to get the Republican nomination from uh, stealing it from him, the incumbent president. Taft was a major advocate of arbitration as a major reform of the progressive era. In 1911, Taft and his Secretary of State, Philander C. Knox, negotiated major treaties with Great Britain and with France, providing that differences be arbitrated. Disputes had to be submitted to the Hague Court or other tribunal. These were signed in August 1911, but they had to be ratified by a two-thirds vote in the Senate. Neither Taft nor Knox consulted with members of the Senate during the negotiations process. By then, many Republicans were opposed to Taft, and the Senate would add amendments Taft could not accept, so it killed those agreements with Britain and France. The arbitration issue opens a window on the philosophical dispute among American progressives at this time. Some, led by Taft, looked to legal arbitration as the best alternative to warfare. Taft was a constitutional lawyer, and in fact he would later become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He had a deep understanding of legal issues. Taft's political base was the conservative business community that largely supported peace movements before 1914. However, his mistake in this case was a failure to mobilize that base. The businessmen believed that economic rivalries were the cause of war, and that extensive trade led to an interdependent world that would make war a very expensive and useless anachronism. That war simply would not function in a world with strong economic reasons not to engage in it. And in fact, this is something that has come about in more recent times, free trade in the 80s and 90s especially into today has blown back uh, sort of the idea of foreign entanglements and foreign wars because it simply becomes too expensive to fight wars against one another whenever your trade and uh, your economy is dependent upon those enemies that you would have in this war. So he, he wasn't necessarily wrong and this group wasn't necessarily wrong. It's just they, they did not come out in force for Taft. However, an opposing faction of progressives, led by Roosevelt, ridiculed arbitration as full-hearted idealism and insisted on the realism of warfare as the only solution to serious international disputes. Roosevelt worked with his close friend, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, to impose those amendments that ruined the goals of those treaties. Lodge thought the treaties would get in the way of senatorial prerogatives. At a deeper level, Roosevelt truly believed that arbitration was a naive solution and that the great issues had to be decided by warfare. The Rooseveltian approach incorporated a near mystical faith, the ennobling nature of war. It endorsed jingoistic nationalism as opposed to the businessman's calculation of profit and national interest. The term jingoistic is a reference to jingoism an extreme form of patriotism, especially in the form of support for an aggressive or warlike foreign policy. In November 1911, a group of Ohio Republicans endorsed Roosevelt for the party's nomination for president. The endorsers include James R. Garfield and Dan Hanna. This endorsement was made by leaders of President Taft's home state. So it's a bit of a, a dig at Taft here. Soon thereafter, Roosevelt said of Taft, quote, <laughs> 
He is utterly unfit for leadership, and this is a time when we need leadership. Unquote. In January 1912, Roosevelt declared that he would serve as a nominee if the people wanted him. Soon after, Roosevelt spoke before the Constitutional Convention in Ohio, openly identifying as a progressive and endorsing progressive reforms, even endorsing popular review of state judicial decisions. In reaction to Roosevelt's proposals for popular overrule of court decisions, Taft likened it to extremists and neurotics. Extreme, certainly. Roosevelt began to envision himself as the savior of the Republican Party from defeat in the upcoming presidential election. So he wasn't con- he wasn't uh, wasn't willing to stay on the sidelines and wait until 1916. He wanted to be sure that he was in there in 1912. So in February, Roosevelt announced in Boston that he would accept the nomination for president. It was at this time that Taft believed that he would be defeated either in the Republican primary or in the general election. The 1912 primaries represented the first extensive use of the presidential primary election, a reform achievement of the progressive movement. The Republican primaries in the South, where party regulars dominated, went for Taft, as did results in New York, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, and Massachusetts. Meanwhile, Roosevelt won in Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, South Dakota, California, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Roosevelt also won Taft's home state of Ohio, as we mentioned. That was a big dig. These primary elections, while demonstrating Roosevelt's continuing popularity with the electorate, were not so uh, consequential. They weren't really pivotal. The final credentials of the state delegates at the National Convention were determined by the National Committee, which was controlled by the party leaders. So they were skewed towards the incumbent president, who had placed those party leaders in their positions. Prior to the 1912 Republican National Convention in Chicago, Roosevelt expressed doubt about his prospects for victory, noting that Taft had more delegates and control of the Credentials Committee. He had just more connections within the political party, partly because he helped to put them there. His only hope, uh, TR's only hope, was to convince party leaders that the nomination of Taft would hand the election to the Democrats, but party leaders were resolutely in favor of Taft. The Credentials Committee awarded almost all contested delegates to Taft, and Taft won the nomination on the first ballot. Black delegates from the South played a key role. They voted heavily for Taft and put him over the top. Because of this result, Roosevelt left the Republican Party and created the Progressive Party structuring it as the permanent organization that would field complete tickets at the presidential and the state level. The party included Roosevelt and key allies such as Pinoche, Cornelia Bri- Bryce Pinoche, who was Pinoche's wife and a longtime friend of Roosevelt's, and Albert Beveridge. The new party was popularly known as the Bull Moose Party after Roosevelt told reporters who had questioned his health, the audacity, the audacity for reporters to question the health of TR. So he said, quote, I'm as fit as a bull moose, unquote. So that's where they got the party name from. At the 1912 Progressive National Convention, Roosevelt was easily nominated and California Governor Hiram Johnson was nominated as Roosevelt's running mate. Roosevelt's platform echoed his 1907-1908 proposals, calling for Vigorous government intervention to protect the people from selfish interests. Quote, To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics, is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. This country belongs to the people. Its resources, its business, its laws, its institutions should be utilized, maintained, or altered in whatever manner will best promote the general interest. This assertion is explicit. Mr. Wilson must know that every monopoly in the United States opposes the Progressive Party. I challenge him to name the monopoly that did support the Progressive Party, whether the Sugar Trust, the U.S. Steel Trust, the Harvester Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, the Tobacco Trust, or any other. Ours was the only program to which they objected, and they supported either Mr. Wilson or Mr. Taft. Unquote. Though many Progressive Party supporters in the North were supporters of civil rights, For blacks, Roosevelt did not give strong support to civil rights. 
As evidence of this, he ran a quote unquote lily white campaign in the South, making efforts to gain white Southerner support rather than black Southerner support. More evidence, whether principled or pragmatic, Roosevelt was not in favor of civil rights, uh, especially because of that when he was rivaled all white and all black delegations where four Southern states arrived at the Progressive National Convention. This progressive party that he set up, that he's there for to be the leader, to be the nominee for this election, Roosevelt only sat the white delegations because there were, of course, like we said, there was an all black delegation from these four southern states. He did not sit them. He only sat the white ones. So it just sort of shows you a little bit of his maybe more pragmatic. Maybe it was because the whites had more power at the time. Uh, who quite knows, but it's it's fairly clear that he was not trying to court the Southern black votes, Southern, Southern black voters. He was not courting them. He was courting those white Southern voters. So now let's fast forward to the general election of 1912 and the slate of three strong candidates running for their respective parties. You had William Howard Taft as the incumbent for the Republican Party, Theodore Roosevelt as the progressive Bull Moose Party candidate for president, and a respected college administrator and governor from New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, as the Democratic Party candidate. After the Democrats nominated Wilson, Roosevelt, in his inner circle, did not expect to win the general election, as Wilson had compiled a record attractive to many progressive Democrats who might have otherwise considered voting for Roosevelt. See, it's so funny to see this delegations of progressive people in the Democrats, progressive people in the Republicans. Today, that's not the case. You don't have progressives on both sides in both of those major parties today. But in 1912, you did. And so progressives that would have potentially voted for Roosevelt because Wilson was the nominee for the Democrats, they ended up having uh, their vote go to Wilson. Roosevelt did still campaign very vigorously, and the election developed into a two-person contest between Wilson and Roosevelt. This was despite Taft's presence in the race as the sitting president that was up for re-election. It's pretty rare that such a thing would happen. Uh, it really hasn't happened since or before this. Roosevelt respected Wilson, but the two differed on various issues. Wilson opposed any federal intervention regarding women's suffrage or child labor because he viewed these issues would vary from state to state, and he attacked Roosevelt's tolerance of some large businesses. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll see, Wilson actually uh, does end up uh, fighting against child labor, uh, whereas uh, as at the federal level, whereas uh, he wasn't in favor of that at this point. After the campaign season and the voting began, the tallies were as such. Roosevelt won 4.1 million votes, representing 27% of the total votes cast, compared to Taft's 3.5 million, which was 23%. Wilson outpaced them both, though not enough to gain more than 42% of the total votes cast. This amounted to 6.3 million votes and a massive landslide in the Electoral College. This is the way the Electoral College kind of works, is you end up with just one more vote in that state, all the electors go to that candidate. So with 435 electoral votes, Wilson won that election. Roosevelt only won 88 electoral votes. Taft won a measly eight. He gained a victory in only two states, Vermont and Utah. Pennsylvania was the only eastern state won by Roosevelt. In the Midwest, he carried Michigan, Minnesota, and South Dakota. In the West, he carried California and Washington. But it was not enough to take over Wilson's overwhelming majority of electoral votes. Wilson's victory represented the first Democratic presidential election victory since Grover Cleveland's 1892 campaign, and was the party's best performance in the Electoral College since before the Civil War. Not surprisingly there. Roosevelt, meanwhile, garnered a higher share of the popular vote than any other third-party presidential candidate in history and won the most states of any third-party candidate after the Civil War. And we wouldn't have someone like him uh, really so far ever again. In history. After losing the 1912 election, Roosevelt and his son Kermit, that's yes, that's his name, Kermit, embarked on a voyage into the jungles of Brazil to explore the Amazon region. 
during the seven month, 15,000 mile expedition, Roosevelt contact, contracted malaria and suffered a serious infection. However, following his return to the U.S., he was in good health and in good spirits. He spent his days writing scientific essays and history books and would get involved in his own way in the global conflict to come. So now we have the setup for uh, the results, uh, the reasons for the results of the 1912 election. And now we fast forward to 1914 with the breakout of World War I. Called the Great War at the time, due to its size, scope, and sheer deadliness, World War I broke out in July of 1914. It pitted an alliance of nations, which would become known as the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and then later Bulgaria, against the Allied Powers, or uh, sometimes Entente Powers, uh, would be the name they used, Entente, uh, Britain, France, Russia, Serbia, Italy, and several other countries. The war fell into a long stalemate with very high casualties on all fronts, but especially senseless casualties were found on the Western Front in France and Belgium. Both sides rejected offers by Woodrow Wilson to mediate an end to the conflict. From 1914 until early 1917, Wilson's primary foreign policy objectives were to keep the United States out of the war in Europe and to broker a peace agreement. He insisted that all U.S. government actions be neutral, stating that Americans, quote, must be impartial in thought as well as in action, must put a curb upon our sentiments as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party to the struggle before another, unquote. As a neutral country, the U.S. insisted on its right to trade with both sides of the conflict, Wilson insisted on neutrality, denouncing both British and German violations of neutrality. The British seized American property in a lot of cases. The Germans would seize American lives. Lots of Americans would get killed uh, because the Germans would fight uh, or sink uh, a ship, a French, British ship, an Entente power ship. However, the powerful British Royal Navy imposed a blockade of Germany and her allies, the Central Powers. They would not allow American goods to pass, no matter what they were. Didn't, they didn't have to be guns and weapons. It was food. They wouldn't let it pass. While the U.S. was at peace, American banks made huge loans to the Entente powers, which were used mainly to buy munitions, raw materials, and food from the U.S. To appease Washington, L London agreed to continue purchasing certain major American commodities, such as cotton, at pre-war prices. And in the event of an American merchant vessel was caught with contraband, the Royal Navy was under orders to buy the entire cargo and then release the vessel back to the U.S. Wilson passively accepted this situation, not wanting to really ruffle any feathers with a major trading partner. In response to the British blockade, the German Empire used their best naval asset and launched a submarine campaign, or U-boats is usually what they're called in German, against the merchant vessels in the sea surrounding the British Isles. By this tactic, the Germans might be able to stem the flow of goods and war material to the island nation, eventually cutting it off and starving it out. Basically, it's a, a, an a effort to do to the British as they were trying to do to them, the Germans. To this end, in early 1915, the Germans sank three American ships. Wilson took the view, based on some reasonable evidence presented to him, that these incidents were accidental. The Germans weren't really knowing that they were American ships, and a settlement of claims was allowed to be postponed until the end of the war. In May 1915, a German submarine famously torpedoed the British ocean liner, the RMS Lusitania, killing 1,198 passengers, including 128 American citizens. Wilson publicly responded by saying, quote, There is such a thing as a man being too proud to fight. There is such a thing as a nation being so right that it does not need to convince others by force that it is right. Unquote. Wilson demanded that the German government take immediate steps to prevent another incident like the sinking of the Lusitania. Some believe Wilson should have placed the defense of American trade rights above neutrality and taken a harsher tone with Germany and her allies. 
America insisted on its neutral rights since the onset of the war, which included allowing private corporations and banks to sell supplies or loan money to either side. So in this case, it would be truly neutral. However, with the tight British blockade of Germany, there was almost no sales or loans to Germany. They're really only going to Britain, France, and her allies. This kind of colored the actions that were to come, the results of the actions that were to come. You know, the money and the material could only really be sold to Britain, the Entente powers. And so therefore, that's the place where the U.S. would sort of hitch its wagon. Uh, the U.S. would end up supporting those allies because whenever they win, then they pay back their loans. In March 1916, the SS Sussex, an unarmed ferry under the French flag, was torpedoed to the English Channel, and four Americans were counted among the dead there. After this incident, Wilson extracted from Germany a pledge to constrain submarine warfare to the rules of cruiser warfare, which represented a major diplomatic concession that Germany would hold to for almost a year. Let me, exp let me explain cruiser rules to you. Uh, the essence of cruiser rules is that an unarmed vessel should not be attacked without any warning. It can be fired on only if it repeatedly fails to stop when ordered to do so or resists being boarded by the attacking ship. The armed ship may only intend to search for contraband in this case, meaning the materials of war, when stopping that merchant ship. If so, the ship may be allowed on its way, as it must be if it is flying the flag of a non-belligerent nation after removal of any found contraband. However, if an attacker like a submarine is intending to take the captured ship as a prize of war or to destroy it, then adequate steps must be taken to ensure the safety of the crew. This would mean taking the crew on board and transporting them to a safe port, which would be mighty impractical with a submarine. It is not usually acceptable to leave the crew in lifeboats, except if their location allows a reasonable expectation of reaching safety by themselves. And this is why also having sufficient supplies and navigational equipment to do so. Interventionalists, so-called because they promoted the idea of intervening in the war on one side or the other, in this case led by Theodore Roosevelt, argued in favor of war with Germany and attacking Wilson's refusal to build up the army in anticipation of eventually joining the war or otherwise being pushed into it. So TR sitting there saying, hey, why aren't you building up this army? You know you're going to end up in this conflict one way or the other. And he was actually actively pushing for it. He wanted to make sure it happened. Toward that end, after the sinking of the Lusitania and the Sussex, Wilson publicly committed himself to what became known as the preparedness movement and began to build up the army and the navy. It still was not not to the level of the Entente and the Central Powers, but it was definitely more than what we had at the time. In June 1916, Congress passed the National Defense Act, which established the Reserve Officers Training Corps and expanded the National Guard. Later in that year, Congress passed the Naval Act, which provided for a major expansion of the Navy. So Wilson was renominated at the 1916 Democratic National Convention without any opposition. In an effort to win progressive voters, Wilson called for legislation providing for an eight-day work, an eight-hour workday, and six-day work week, health and safety measures, and the prohibition of child labor, as well as safeguards for female workers. He also favored a minimum wage for all work performed by and for the federal government. So you see how he's once again playing the sides of progressivism in some way, taking voters that would otherwise vote for Roosevelt, taking voters that would otherwise uh, cast their vote for the Republican nominee because both sides, Democrats and Republicans, had progressives in this time period. The Democrats also campaigned on the slogan, he kept us out of the war, and warned that a Republican victory would mean certain war with Germany, which, spoiler alert, would happen anyway under Democratic leadership in 1917. Hoping to reunify the progressive and conservative wings of the party, the 1916 Republican National Convention nominated the Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes for president. As a justice, he had been totally out of politics in 1912. They just didn't want that legacy of the split of the party, Taft and Roosevelt. There was bad blood there. They didn't want to uh, stir that around. So they brought in Charles Evans Hughes 
And Republicans attacked Wilson's foreign policy on various grounds and domestic affairs were actually dominating the campaign. So it wasn't about what was happening over there. It was about what was happening here in the U.S. Republicans campaigned against Wilson's new freedom policies, especially tariff reduction, which might hurt American businesses, new income taxes. The Adams Act uh, was the last thing that they protested. Basically, it was a they dictated pay for railroad workers across the country. It was a federal law making sure that railroad workers got a certain pay. Uh, and this was to, to fight um, uh, the ability uh, for them to strike or the possibility for them to strike and then shut down the country because they weren't getting paid enough. So for not really being on the radar, at least historically, the election of 1916 was really close. And the outcome was in doubt because Hughes was ahead in the east and Wilson was in uh, the south and the west. The decision came down to California. So on November 10th, California certified that Wilson had won the state by 3,806 votes, razor thin var margin, giving him a majority of the electoral vote. Nationally, Wilson won 277 electoral votes with 49.2% of the popular vote while Hughes won 254 electoral votes and 46.1% of the popular vote. Wilson was able to win by picking up many votes that had gone to Roosevelt or to Debs in 1912, likely from his new progressive stances on working conditions. So he gained, like I said, a lot of those progressive votes that would otherwise have gone to TR. He swept the solid South and won all but a handful of Western states, while Hughes won most of the Northeastern and Midwestern states. Wilson's reelection made him the first Democrats as Andrew Jackson in 1832 to win two consecutive terms. The get Democrats also kept control of Congress in this election, so that was very important for them. With the results of the election and another Wilson administration, it might have been a surprise to the American people that Wilson would reverse course on his stance for World War I so quickly. But it would happen. At this point, I want to remind you of the position of Woodrow Wilson uh, in his presidency. So with regards to the outbreak and of the Great War, 1914, from the outset, 1914 to January 1917, Wilson's primary goal was using American neutrality to broker a peace conference that would end the war. In the first two years, neither side was really interested in negotiations. However, that changed in late 1916 when Philip de Zelikow argues it, that both sides are ready for peace negotiations. Philip uh, Zelikow, he's a historian. Uh, they were interested in the peace negotiations, but they wanted Wilson to be the broker between them. However, Wilson waited too long. He waited too long in late 1916. He failed to realize the importance of his financial power over Britain, and he put mis sort of mistaken a uh, reliance on Colonel House and Secretary of State Robert Lansing, who undermined his proposals because they encouraged Britain to stall for a more advantageous position. Zelikow emphasizes that German Chancellor Bethmann Holweg was seriously interested in peace, but he had to fend off the demand of generals Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff, who were by that time getting danger close to taking dictatorial control over Germany. And eventually they would. And so Wilson sort of lost his chance. He did make some peace proposals in January 1917, but it was really too little too late. Too little, too late. The situation had changed in Europe. And the Germans, they really weren't, uh, especially Ludendorff, Hindenburg, they weren't willing to give it up so easily anymore. They weren't willing to come to peace negotiations. So what had changed in 1917? Belgium and northern France were occupied by the Germans. Russia was ending its czarist rule, and eventually they would drop out of the war entirely. And the remaining Entente nations were low on credit. Germany actually appeared to have a, a, the upper hand at this point. The British economic embargo, the naval blockade of Germany, though, it caused lots of shortages of fuel and food, which caused them to resume or at least uh, argue for the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. So they wouldn't go by cruiser rules anymore. So the aim was to break the transatlantic supply chain for Britain from other nations like the U.S., especially the U.S., although the German high command realized that by sinking these American flagged ships, 
it would almost certainly bring the United States into the war. So therefore, instead of brokering uh, with, with a Wilson and brokered peace, the war hit new levels of escalation. Hindenburg and Ludendorff had convinced the Kaiser the victory was at hand by using that unrestricted submarine warfare, and they could move troops from the Russian front to smash the French and British on the Western front. And they were so certain of that would put an end to the war. They didn't really care about the Americans potentially getting involved because they just couldn't do it quickly enough is what their thought was. The Americans couldn't do it quickly enough. The advisors to the Kaiser, they felt like America was uh, enormously powerful, economically especially, but just too weak militarily to really make a difference. Uh, they just – they thought – that unrestricted submarine warfare would do way more damage than it did. The reality was America had too much with regards to ships and material and and other you know war materials to put forward to Britain, to put forward to France, that uh, that alone really made a huge difference and then staved off their defeat by the Germans until then the Americans could actually show up in force and they would show up in force. Historians such as Ernest May have approached the process of American entry into the war as a study in how public opinion changed radically in three years' time. Apart from the Anglophile element calling for support for the British, the American public opinion in 1914 all the way through 1916 showed a strong desire to stay out of the war. Most Americans saw it as a dreadful mistake, and they were determined to just simply stay away. Neutrality was particularly strong among the Irish Americans, which didn't like the British, German Americans, who obviously liked the Germans, and Scandinavian Americans, as well as among church leaders, women, and the rural white South. But by 1917, the same public felt just as strongly that going to war was both necessary and wise. Military leaders had little to say during this debate, and military considerations and foreign policy were not often considered. The decision, uh, the decisive questions dealt with morality and visions of the future. The prevailing attitude in America was that the United States possessed a superior moral position, which, of course, we would think we would, as the only great nation devoted to the principles of freedom and democracy. By staying aloof from the squabbles of reactionary empires, it could preserve those ideas. Sooner or later, the rest of the world would come to appreciate and adopt them. It was like the, the, the shining city on a hill kind of situation. They'll see our example and they'll follow it. But by 1917, that really wasn't coming about. There was some, some severe danger that in the short run, powerful forces that would be adverse to democracy and freedom would triumph. And that is a problem in modern United States uh, politics as well, that these forces against democracy, against freedom of choice would prevail. And so we need to fight against those uh, positions and those people. Strong support for moralism came from religious leaders women led by Jane Adams, and from public figures like longtime Democratic leader William Jennings Bryan. The most important moralist of all was actually President Woodrow Wilson himself, the man who dominated decision making so totally that the American perspective of the war has been labeled Wilson's War. Uh, and there is no telling what might have been if World War I in America had been known as Theodore's War or Roosevelt's War meaning that Theodore Roosevelt had won the election in 1912 and potentially, probably, joined the Entente powers in 1914. In 1917, Wilson won the support of most of the moralists by, by proclaiming it as, quote, a war to make the world safe for democracy, unquote. If the American people truly believed in their ideals, he explained, now is the time to fight. The question then became whether Americans would fight for what they deeply believed in, and the answer turned out actually to be a resounding yes. Some of this attitude was mobilized by the spirit of 1917, which evoked the spirit of 76, as in 1776, the year the British uh, were kicked out of the U.S. Uh, American independence. Yay! Anti-war activists at the time, and eventually in the 1930s, alleged that beneath the veneer of moralism and idealism, there must have been some ulterior motives. And this, is, this has got potential here. Some suggested a conspiracy on the part of New York City bankers who held $3 billion of war bonds to the Allied, the Entente powers. Uh, 
or the steel and chemical firms selling munitions to the Allies. The interpretation was popular among left-wing progressives and among the agrarian wing of the Democratic Party. These forces would ensure that neutrality laws were passed in the 1930s, which would prevent financial entanglements from dragging the nation into a war. Uh, basically, they tried to pass laws that uh, made sure that uh, even if business interests want to be part of the war, that the U.S. won't necessarily get involved. Historian Harold C. Searitt has demonstrated that business in general, the businesses in general, supported neutrality. Other historians state that the pro-war element uh, was really animated not by profit, but actually by disgust with what Germany had did, especially in Belgium. This is actually sometimes called the rape of Belgium and the threat it represented to American ideals. Belgium kept the public sympathy as the Germans w just went around executing civilians, uh, being very um, significantly uh, brutal to the population in Belgium. An American engineer and eventual Republican president, Herbert Hoover, led a private relief effort that won widespread support for Belgium and for the Allies. Compounding the atrocities in Belgium were new weapons that the Americans found distasteful and evil, like poison gas and the aerial bombardment of innocent civilians, which happened through the use of Zeppelins dropping bombs on London. Even though poison gas was used by both sides, uh, Germans were the ones that used it first. Uh, there was anti-war spokespersons really didn't claim that Germany was innocent of these things. They just said that it, war was so atrocious. Let's just stay out of it. It's beneficial to no one. Uh, but you did have people arguing for moralist and idealist views. Let's get rid of these bad things that are happening in the world. Progressive writer and intellectual Randolph Bourne criticized the moralist philosophy, claiming that it was a justific justification by American intellectual and power elites like President Wilson for going to war unnecessarily. And he was a contemporary. He lived through World War I. He argued that the push for war started with the preparedness movement that we mentioned in 1916, and that was fueled by big business. While big business would not push much further than that, the preparedness movement, benefiting the most from neutrality, the movement would eventually evolve into a war cry, led by war hawk intellectuals under the guise of moralism. So Bourne believed that the elites knew full well what was going to go to what would push people to war, what that would entail, and the price in American lives that it would cost. If American elites could portray the United States' role in the war as noble, they could convince the generally isolationist American public that war would be acceptable. And they, they seems like they certainly were able to do that. Above all considerations, American attitudes towards Germany focused on their U-boats, which sank the Lusitania in 1915, and we mentioned the Sussex and other passenger ships really without adhering to those cruiser rules. That appeared to Americans as an unacceptable challenge to America's rights as a neutral country, to trade with both sides, and as an unforgivable affront to humanity. So all things considered, it came to be that Wilson's decision to enter the war would happen in April 1917, when he asked Congress for the declaration of war on Germany more than two and a half years after the war began. The main reasons, as we've mentioned, were German submarine campaign to sink American ships carrying supplies to Britain. Uh, one thing we did not mention that we mentioned maybe in more detail some other time is the Zimmerman telegram, which offered German support to Mexican forces if they would cause trouble along the U.S. border and our already detailed moralistic stance. Namely, that the determination to make world, uh, we wanted to make the world safe for democracy, is what Wilson called it. Wilson had finally decided that war was necessary because Germany threatened American global ideals of democracy and peace through militarism and Prussian autocracy. It's not really mentioning any of the British autocracy, monarchy, Russian monarchy. Uh, no, those are fine, but the Prussians, they're the bad ones. Suffice to say, it's a little bit uh, inconsistent, at least logically. But either way, that's the side we came down on. Furthermore, it was a threat to American commerce. That's really what it is. It's the money, folks. And to America's rights as a neutral country, being able to trade with whoever we like. Public opinion, the elite's opinion, and members of Congress gave Wilson strong support uh, in that declaration or asking Congress for the declaration. And it's actually a sign of America's newfound stance as a world power that the U.S. took an independent role. They did not have a formal alliance with Britain or France to come into the war. They just said, we're declaring war on Germany, and here it is. They did end up cooperating very well 
Uh, and like I said, we probably will cover that at a future episode. The U.S. would immediately provide money and more supplies to Britain and France and the Entente powers and a small military force, relatively very small, uh, to fight on the Western Front immediately. You know, as soon as they could, they went. American troops began major combat operations under General John J. Pershing in the summer of 1918, and they were arriving at a rate of 10,000 soldiers a day until the end of the war, which would happen in November 1918. Famous for his stance to get involved in the conflict, Woodrow, excuse me, Theodore Roosevelt would lose one of his sons in action in World War I. Uh, he was in, in the Air Corps, and he would be shot down. So he, he put his money where his mouth is, in a way there. TR encouraged his children to get involved in military, and his son, Quentin, would go on to be in the Air Corps, shot down over France. So the only sitting president to have a son die in U.S. military action. You know, say what you will about the elites sending children and, the, and kids off to fight a war for them without sending their own. But you've got you've to send some respect and some props to Theodore Roosevelt and his family, his sons, Quentin especially, because he gave, you know, the ultimate, he paid the ultimate price by sacrificing his life to fight for this, make the world safe for democracy and for freedom, uh, as Wilson would have said. Uh, that he did. And so I've got to give some respect to the Roosevelt's there with regards to, you know, kind of uh, having the attitude of putting their money where their mouth is, you know, s saying that I want to go to war, we should be in involved with this, we should be on the side of Britain. That's what TR argued for. And his son went out there and fought for that. And uh, sacrificed for that. And his fa entire family sacrificed for that. I think that's very respectable. It began with a bull moose, a falling out between Republican colleagues, and an election with three major candidates, which then led to policies of neutrality and keeping the United States out of the most terrible war known to man at the time, until it could no longer stay on the sidelines. Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson all played integral parts in stopping America from getting involved in World War I for several years. That American election result would have huge economic, social, and political implications for the next century. Alternative history folks like to play with the idea of what would have happened had Roosevelt led the U.S. to join the Entente powers in 1914. But alas, this is not something we discuss in this podcast. The results of American involvement in World War I and World War I itself are likely to be a topic we will cover in Threads of History in the future. Thank you for listening to this episode on the election of 1912 and American neutrality. This has been Threads of History. I am Mike Shellhammer. Thank you for listening. You can email your comments and suggestions to threads.historypodcast at gmail.com. Listen to more Threads of History on Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. <laughs>